experienced in different ways. And this is going to be part of, of this uh, discussion, uh, how we define democracy. And uh, I have taken a safer route and said that safer route is looking by what has been current, the currency of democracy within the ILO and the UN system uh, since the Second World War. And in fact, because that, that is important because that's the basis on which uh, freedom of association is uh, actually uh, based. That, you know, it's based on that conception of, of freedom of uh, uh, freedom of, uh, of association that responds to uh, you know, plural democracy. So that's Professor, that's, that's, Professor that's, sorry to interrupt you, but just to remind you, if you want to, us to present the the PowerPoint, we can start now. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, Thank okay. you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. I'll show my screen, Professor. I'll show my screen. Okay, yeah, yes, ahead. yes, Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah, that will help. Thank you. Ah, it's not coming yet, but yeah, yeah I'm waiting for it. Mm -hmm. You can go straight to the second slide, as far as I remember. Okay, where is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's coming through. Yeah, here, it, I've got it, I've got it now. Yeah. Can, can you, the second, the second word, please, Victor? Thank you very much. And uh, I was, as I was saying, the aim is to show the close link between freedom of association and plural democracy and by using selected examples of where the ILO has intervened, uh, you know, through the supervisory bodies. In our case, we are talking about the Committee on Freedom of Association, but also other committees. And, you know, in, in order to promote uh, international labor standards and the, and implement them. So th this is the uh, the aim of the lecture. If you could do, Victor, please, can you go right to the to the bottom because I want to put the the discussion points uh, ahead and then go back to the beginning. Would you that do that for me, please? Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought I should start with this in terms of uh, putting across what I think we might draw out by way of discussion and thus as i said the first one is to interrogate uh the linkages at least give an historical account and argument why uh, the ilo believes that there is a connection uh, between freedom of association and democracy but also i think a pertinent question uh and uh prof antonio and is prof anna here is she with us today? Who? Profana, is she here? Is Anna here? I am here, yes. You are here, I, yeah. I, I, I was saying that the two of you in particular, because you are ex experts on this, you, do, you, have, you pick up the issue of, uh, very often we talk about the effectiveness of uh, international law or international instruments. In the absence, if we compare them to uh, municipal legal system, and I, I'm saying here that one of the discussion points I think we should focus on is to explore the limits of CFA and ILO interventions, and we are going to to look at that with the you know drawing out examples of ongoing uh, previous and ongoing cases. So I think that would be a good discussion point. But I also want to bring forth uh, to your minds the, 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 the issue of the fundamental differences in the political systems. You know, sort of if you talk the typical Western system, of course, which is uh, dominant for, uh, for the West and the developing world that we belong to. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, the the technician has managed to get me the 
the word going. So I'll just switch over. Leave that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, no, no. Leave it for now, for you because I'm talking to this the last one, and then I'll go. Ah, okay, okay. You want to close it? Okay. Yeah, she's just adjusting. Ah, now you got it. Please turn on the microphone. Professor Evans. And Sebastiana. Just to turn, yes. turn on the microphone. Yeah. And, okay. <laughs> she, 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 missed, she missed her vocation. She would have made a very good, uh, you know, very and good that, IT, IT specialist. Thank you. Yeah. Regardless of it, uh, yeah. So I was saying, if we look at our discussion points, there are these issues I think that we should bear in mind as we go. And uh, I would really appreciate uh, my being stopped, comments, and also asking questions, which we can discuss as we go along. And of course, there's the issue uh, of the, the partnership between the ILO and member states. Because you remember, and that is also tied to technical assistance because uh, it's interesting and I'll, I'll share with you a case uh, where the a member state uh, makes it conditional to give tech assistance in another area to a country observing international labor standards. A very un unusual, but there's one country as we shall see which tends to do that now under the uh, the African concessionary kind of uh, export regime, which is referred to as the African Growth Opportunities Act, which exempts a whole lot of African countries uh, from, you know, from certain tar tariffs, but, you know, subject to certain conditions. So we'll look at that. So I would like us to, to look, to bear that in mind, that once they extend the scope of growth for this kind of partnership, both positive and negative. Because uh, ev evidently, I think uh, member countries uh, do have their own uh, personal interest, if I may put it that way, in, in sort of fostering uh, certain standards over others. And then of course, that links uh, also into uh, the, the issue of technical assistance. How how effective is it? And are we going to look at that also in a, an, uh, an historical sense in terms of the examples of where the ILO has intervened and how that has made a difference. So I thought I should put these discussion points up front for you to, to think uh, you know, along them alongside them as we as we continue our our conversation but also just to uh you know to to encourage you to, uh, to comment or yeah, ask questions as we go along this is not uh, as long a lecture as the previous ones we have had so we, we have a lot of time victor please if you can go to the beginning now back to the beginning thank you Yes, uh, so as I was, yeah, yeah. So these, the, the, the thing is, there, there has been and the, a, a, a very historical link in ILO terms between democracy and social justice. And the argument here is that uh, uh, social democracy is part and parcel of the, the quest for social justice and freedom of association. And that, uh, if you look back to our first uh, conversation, was really the basis of the ILO mandate and mission. You know, that through social justice, 
which assumes, uh, and this is the line of argument, certain democratic basic rights, you sort of, uh, uh, freedom of association is, is linked to, uh, to that. In other ways, that the right of employers and, and workers to choose their own representatives and organize freely is a fundamental symbol of democratic dispensation. And this, this symbol is both internally within the organizations, because as, he, uh, as you know, uh, the, that is the, 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 the issue of internal, uh, particularly trade union democracy, is a, a very significant one as compared to the external uh, element. And this is as between the unions internally and the unions and the employers organization, I'm talking about the two with external kind of forces. So there's that link as well. So the, the view is, and this is, I, I keep getting back uh, to, in terms of the ILO, that the universal uh, acceptance of democracy as it has been decide, uh, defined in terms of the ILO mission, is key uh, to the governance of uh, uh, societies and that uh, freedom of association is, uh, uh, is part of that. Otherwise, uh, uh, democracy becomes an illusion. Incidentally, I'm lying a lot for this lecture on uh, the current uh, chief of the Freedom of Association branch, Karen Curtis, who uh, 15 years ago uh, wrote a masterpiece in terms of uh, discussing the linkages between democracy and freedom of association. And that, to my mind, still stands. It's, not, it's outdated in some, in some parts in terms of the cases it uses, but in terms of the concepts, uh, you know, sort of it's still valid. And uh, I'm grateful to her for this, uh, that, you know, I've, I'm relying on that because it's the clearest. And I compared it with the, the more recent kind of interventions. I think it speaks to the issue of democracy and, uh, and freedom of association uh, clearer than any, any of the contribution uh, from scholars. So the freedom of association, it is, uh, you know, further argued, uh, it sort of provides partners, the workers and employers, as partners in the economic activities. That is not only about political rights we are talking about. We are talking about the fundamentals of work, and the fundamentals of work uh, are economic activities that provide for society's needs. And the argument here is that these are interlinked, that the uh, the freedom of association and the unique partnership, tripartite partnership between government and the social partners uh, enables uh, member countries to be able to pursue their economic activities that provide for you know society's uh, society's uh, needs. So the ILO, and this is a line I'm taking, has been has played a special role, not only in the sort of supporting democracy, uh, sometimes literally, uh, in a very extended, broader context, stretching it a bit, you know, in terms of in the name of social justice, but much more, I think much more kind of specifically in terms of the, the specific support it provides through its interventions in the promotion and implementation of, of uh, international labor standards. The next uh, word, please, Victor. Yes. So in doing that, the ILO, of course, has relied on a number of uh, key instruments that deal with uh, freedom of association. And we have seen those before. Namely, there were a uh, in fact, uh, interestingly, one of the major ones that we more or less sought to lay the basis uh, for freedom of association and fundamental principles 
was before was during the second world war when it was sort of uh, it seemed clear i think to countries that the end of the war would entail would require a new kind of approach and so you have it in the, uh in the declaration of Philadelphia in 1944 uh, more or less anticipating uh, these these fundamental principles. And then, of course, those were confirmed in terms of freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, 87 and, and uh, 98, subsequently 1948 and 19, uh, 1949. So what these did was to confirm, if you like, uh, a space for uh, free discussion and democratic decision making uh, using freedom of association as a central element to that. Because uh, one can argue that subsequent kind of uh, quest or search for freedom of association started with the ILO itself. And it's interesting, I mean, Karen Curtis, uh, you know, tells of the story of uh, the the first director general of the ILO, Abad Toma, uh, where he, first of all, he was a, a chauvinist, a male chauvinist of the Western, West kind, you know, in keeping with his generation. But also, he, in, in his conception, he did not really like to accord, he had this social justice kind of in mind, but for, for him, it was for the outside organization, not within the ILO. And so it was taken on to sort of to that, you know, freedom of association, charity begins at home. So you, yeah, the, the, this, the, the, the Philadelphia Declaration, I think, was the first basis that gave rise uh, to that thinking. And that's where, uh, incidentally, all this tripartite kind of what was the Wilsonian concept was conceived. And even Wilson, President Wilson, was very doubtful about the, the, you know, the prudence of uh, entering what at the time looked like a very revolutionary kind of approach to international relations. Because up to uh, definitely at that point, and uh, you know very, uh, very well from the the basics of international law, uh, you know, the persons were subjects, objects, not subjects of international law. It, it's the states to try and sort of extend the participation in decision making or treaty making, as in this case, was a very revolutionary idea. So that, that but that happened and uh, I suppose there hasn't been any looking back ever since. There have been sort of a, attempts now, and those attempts in, of uh, unfulfilled, and when I say unfulfilled, unfulfilled kind of sort of vision, the vision that, you know, the ILO, which like uh, many international organizations, remains very, very male-centered. And now they have, they have been trying over the years and uh, both you, Professor Antonio, and Professor Anna, you know this, to try and mainstream gender equality and gender equity. So it's the, other than that, which is uh, continuing, and, and uh, in the next lecture, we'll look at how the ILO is now trying to mainstream once and for all, not only in, a, you know, in parlance, in activities in terms of uh, uh, gender equity and gender equality. Uh, next start is uh, Victor. So, as we indicated in one of our uh, previous uh, conversations, over 3,000, almost uh, 4,000 complaints have been considered by the CFA. But in addition to that, of course, there have been quite, quite a few uh, fact-finding and conciliation commissions not to mention commissions of inquiry under, under uh, Article 26. And the whole idea I keep emphasizing, and it cannot be emphasized, that 
This, at least in the ILO's aim, has been to reinforce democracy through freedom of association. So you have the the ILO, I think uh, the DG, I think it was the Somavia actually, the Chilean, the one from your sphere. He was a DG in 2004, uh, where he says, look, over the last four years, it has been become increasingly apparent that to promote freedom of association as a, a human right at work, we need to understand its intimate connection with the enlargement of democracy. The efficiency of market-oriented uh, development and social justice. So it's there again, sort of the emphasis that there is that uh, interlinkage between freedom of association and democracy. Next word, please, Victor. Thank you. Yes, and this then brings me, let me pause here and encourage you to, to react. Is any, any comments we have so far in terms of what I'm trying to put across? Please. Paolo, I see you are very, you look very expectant there. No, I was just uh, um, uh, reminding. Yes, um, yes, Professor Antonio, yes. I was trying to remind how important was this discussion during the time that we have the criticism from the Soviet Union, the extinguished yes. Soviet Union, and they yes. criticized the ILO for being uh, Western uh, uh, guided uh, uh, conception of, of freedom of association, that freedom of yes. association during the doctrine, uh, instead of the doctrine of the ILO, could be uh, uh, only part of, uh, of uh, uh, freedom of association, because that, there could be another uh, perspective of freedom of association under mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, Soviet Union uh, doctrine. And, yeah, um, yeah. Well, it, it was very important because uh, at that time uh, it was was definite the 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 existence of ILO. Yeah. Uh, only because uh, also because we have uh, our <laughs> right wing dictatorships here in South America and <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> just contrasting yes. different perspectives. Yes. yes. No, you are definitely right, and that that Professor Antonio. That contestation isn't over because, as you have seen, one of the issues I think we shall focus on in relation particularly to China and Cuba mm -hmm. is precisely that. The criticism yeah. that the, the conception of freedom of association is too Western. It doesn't take account of the way the uh, sort of socialist states, uh, you know, which are collective, that this is too individualistic. Uh, so I think we'll come back to that, but you are definitely right. During those times, that was the, you know, the Soviet Union's word. And the, interestingly, Professor Antonio, Russia, which by all means is, uh, is the heir, I think, to the Soviet Union in some ways, uh, is very sort of, uh, tends to, to be very aloof to all these discussions. And it shows even in the, in the voting patterns, whenever there's a report of the CFA taken to the governing body for approval, one of the countries that tends to abstain uh, is Russia. So they haven't given up on the doubts that, you know, this, as far as they are concerned, this is not freedom of the democracy as the ILO has, uh, you know, sort of outlined it, isn't uh, democratic. It's, it's that argument. I think we can, we can chat about it some more. So you are definitely right. And then sort of, so I, I thought we should, all, I should, we should also look at the at freedom of association as, the, uh, as part of the struggle with civil liberties. Because when you talk of democracy, you are talking of, uh, you know, initially in any way, and this is because, uh, as, the, as you know, 
the whole issue of economic and social rights is a second generation one. You are talking about the first generation of rights, which tends to be civil liberties. Uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, basic rights, to, so to speak. And so freedom of association, just to emphasize, that it has got the same roots with the uh, civil liberties. When you think of civil liberties, you are thinking of liberty, independence, read that for autonomy in the workplace and among employers' uh, organization. You are talking of pluralistic uh, sort of participation, this, uh, decision making. And uh, the argument goes, and in fact, there have been cases where this has been demonst demonstrated both uh, in both our continents, in Africa and the Latin America, that where there is no political democracy, uh, more often than not, there is no freedom of association for workers and, and the, you know, employers to freely organize, let alone choose representatives and exercise legitimate activities. So th there's that link in terms of civil liberties. And during the past half century, uh, going to 70 now, because I think as I mentioned, the Committee on Freedom of Association will be 70 next year and the other supervisory bodies have examined uh, cases that have sought to affirm, to reinforce the notion that freedom of association is a corollary to democratic uh, dispensation. And usually, and this is the other, the inverse, is that uh, freedom of association, the struggle for, for freedom of association tends to be a proxy for the expression of public opinion, public dis discontent more often than not. Because, and this has, has got, I uh, don't know, are you, please share with me in terms of what the, the, ex uh, the experience in Latin America was, but definitely in Africa, including South Africa in particular. Uh, it was the, the existence you know, not by design, but by omission, more, than, more or less, that uh, for some reason they gave space to the trade unions and progressive work, uh, employers, and they use their struggle for freedom of uh, association at the workplace uh, to be proxy for, you know, for the uh, expression of public disconsent. And in the end, and this made it, this point is made very, very clear in terms of many uh, situations, uh, the uh, globally that these freedom of association struggle for uh, link to civil liberties tended to be a catalyst for broader political democracy. And that's the, is, there are definitely instances that we'll see some of them as we go down where the, this uh, has been the case. Victor, next, please. And so what I've done here is he selected a few countries and in a very glossing over kind of approach as the illustrations of uh the opportunities uh that the ILO has taken and use them to intervene to foster democracy through uh freedom of association but these examples also show the limits of that because there are a lot of cases where there have been ILO interventions and we, on all continents i think uh definitely Africa, Latin America, uh, Europe itself, and uh, maybe not so much North America, but definitely Asia, where there have been limits of your yeah, ILO intervention, where in some cases it, it sort of, uh, you know, sort of appeared to be so promising, but in time, actually, that has the, yeah, that has uh, sort of uh, uh, stored in one way or another. So you do have these examples of the setback. So uh, I, would, I would 
I would suggest that you know in in going through some of the, these examples with me, please think and intervene uh, of any other examples you might be aware of and what the what is behind the limitations. So let's take uh, uh, Poland. Poland, I think, was the first country in Eastern Europe, you know, before the breakup of the Soviet uh, sphere of influence, that really sort of uh, showed the way. And the, uh, the ILO, of course, he was very optimistic about this, positively optimistic. And since the, the situation with the, the rise of solidarity to intervene with uh, the appointment of the Commission of Inquiry, and you know concerning and this again uh, you remember takes us to this fundamental principle issue that you know yeah as it happens i think i'm not uh yes as it happens poland had the uh ratified both 87 and 98 and so in 1984 a commission of inquiry was the uh, uh, appointed, established to inquire about whether Poland was uh, keeping its obligations, observing its obligations under under freedom of association. And in the end, of course, uh, you know that was it resulted into a broader kind of democratic uh, transformation in Eastern Europe. The first one, I think, and the, followed by the creation of the. Uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, and the, in terms of Poland, it has never really looked back in terms of democracy, whether whether he, uh, at least there is democratic space uh, that continues. Whether uh, uh, and the, I think there is no question that unlike Belarus, I think the Polish kind of approaches, no matter how sort of uh, uh, retrogressive. Uh, as a fellow traveler, I would probably look at them as retrogressive in some ways in terms of rice, but it's still very democratic. So that was uh, the start. And the uh, one example, I think, that you can sort of, you can hold out in Europe itself as the, the bearer of, of, of this torch uh, that he, towards transformation, democratic transformation. And then, of course, you have got uh, Africa, uh, South Africa in particular. South Africa, as I keep uh, saying, like Brazil, is a world in one country. In many respects, uh, I keep saying, except for the weather, I don't think you have got the variety in Brazil of the uh, climate zones that South Africa has. But in every way, in political dispensation, in population, in cultural terms, it's a world in one, uh, you know, in one country, and it was dominated, of course, as you know, by the system of apartheid. And uh, uh, just going back to that sort of linkage I mentioned, this is one space where the uh, the unions and progressive employers with the NGOs and civil liberty organizations somehow sees the, the, the space that the apartheid regime could not totally control and uh, pushed uh, for changes. For the changes, I think that uh, for a very long time, I mean, sort of kept with outside pressure, of course, kept the the hope the hope of uh, democracy ticking and eventually at the turn of uh, just before the, the the last decade of the last century in 1992 uh COSATU, which is uh, still the main uh, trade union uh, federation here managed with the help of the international trade union confederation uh, to sort of, it was ICFTU that time, to take a complaint on freedom of association, uh, you know, to the ILO. And the ILO is interesting in terms of, if you look at the background in South Africa at that time, because I remember it uh, clearly, because that was a time 
when I was I uh, started on doing my thesis, and uh, uh, in Oxford, and my my supervisor was very excited about all these uh, changes, apparent changes. So he uh, advised me to read what at that time was the, the most emphatic kind of sort of commission of inquiry appointed by government, headed by uh, a legal academic who was not, who was not, uh, I, I suppose he was, uh, he was regarded, I think, in, in regime terms as not one of them. Vian, called Vian. I think the, uh, the old gentleman is still alive. And they produced this uh, six volume, uh, you know, commission report. And I always joke that I must be one of the few people who read that. I was forced to read it in terms of, and there, I think, at that point, and this is the point I wanted to make, uh, the, the regime, the apartheid regime, I think, was beginning to mellow. They were beginning to sort of to pay attention to outside pressures. For, for them, uh, you know, sort of remarkably and rather surprisingly, even by the ILO, they allowed uh, an ILO fact-finding mission and conciliation mission to come in following a report that they complained that was standard before the, 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 the committee or, you know, on freedom of association. And so, as it were, and in fact, the, uh, the subheading of that report was the prelude to change in other ways, you know, in anticipation of change, uh, started a conversation that eventually, uh, Victor, the next word, please, started a conversation that initially, I think, sort of broadened the agenda. And, you know, what's, what's notable at that time is that South Africa was not even a member of the ILO. They intervened uh, on the basis that the South Africa, before it was forced to withdraw in 1966, had ratified 87 and 98, and, uh, you know, for better or worse, for them, I think it just escaped their mind. They never denounced them. So they use that as saying, look, these are fundamental principles. You may not be a member, but uh, I think it would be exaggerate, uh, exaggerating to suggest that he, that was really what forced them. I think what, what he, uh persuaded the South African to come to the table, as I said, was this increasing pressure. And they were looking for a way out. And the ILO more or less uh, provided uh, the means. And that's what uh, the ILO also tried to do in Zimbabwe. And I'll come and uh, you know, talk to that with less, less success because that, that problem is still, is still continuing. And so this, yes. yes. I have one question. Could yes. you explain to us or tell us how was this process by which uh, South Africa was forced to withdraw of the ILO yeah. in 1966? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it wasn't one single act. You remember it started from as people, as progressive forces became more and more critical of the apartheid regime and the excesses here were increasing, particularly starting from 63 where it was really getting worse and worse. The, the oppression, the imprisonment. So globally, sitting with the UN, you know, this pressure started. They would never, uh, every time South Africa went to the ILO, they, they would be, they would find the, the, the sort of the credentials committee will find a way of excluding them as being in, in breach of the fundamental principles of the ILO and the UN and so forth. So eventually, the, in 66, they withdrew, but it wasn't a voluntary withdrawal as such. They were forced because their presence in international forums was, was untenable. That's what happened. Okay. okay. And uh, yeah, but the point is, uh, Prof Professor Anna, is that uh, in spite of that, and uh, also simply emphasizing the fact that they had started to mellow 
by the during the last the decade of uh, the last century uh they you know they they saw it as to their advantage to open up space to talk and so the uh, the ILO came in with this commission and then sort of uh, uh it, it also i think quite clearly and there are historians and political uh, scientists that have do documented this it clearly contributed to the turning of public opinion even among the the white ruling class particularly the middle class it you know sort of it started turning the you know the attention towards you know questioning the system much more uh, much more sort of harshly and the, by 1994 as we we have seen there was a whole turn around and they settled so it was just to make the point that this creation of space the link between democracy and freedom of association goes both ways you know sort of that and this is an example where the space that you might say that had been ceded to workers and employers you know inadvertently you know resulted into the sort of pushing broadening the boundaries to the point of political transformation Is that is that uh, okay, Profana? Yes, yes. Uh, very interesting to yeah. learn all this history. Yeah. The, the next word. Uh, thank you. The, the next word, uh, uh, Victor. And so, the role of that the ILO played was publicly acknowledged not only by the South African delegation, but I think. Uh, uh, Mandela as well. Mandela that year, I don't know what year, I think it was 1995 that he addressed the ILO, you know, went personally to thank the ILO about it. And in fact, in it's interesting, Professor Antonio, you also be interested in this, that one of the remarkable uh, sort of outcomes of the ILO backing and assistance to countries like South Africa and a few others has been and if you compare uh, with other countries across the continent, is that South Africa, both in constitutional law, I'm sure both of you, Professor Anna and the Professor Antonio, you are familiar with this, the African, the South African Constitutional Court in terms of how it has managed to create a, a framework, a very strong framework of human rights. And what they did, was a sort of, uh, they borrowed and bent. You know, they looked at uh, the German model, the American model, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Canadian model and the, you know, models in, in South America and came up with this dispensation. But what is remarkable, even more remarkable than that, is uh, their labor law. The South African labor law, more than any other labor law to this day, Mirrors, mirrors international labor standards more than most most countries. And that was, for them, I think you could say, this was, the, uh, for them, they saw it as the ILO being best, uh, present at the creation of the democratic dispensation, but it inf influences and continues to influence the thinking. When you look, I mean, the ILO, one of the, the things they are trying to encourage now. And uh, I would welcome any any kind of sort of uh, uh, exchange of notes with Brazil in this regard, is that the ILO now tries to encourage uh, judges to resort to the use of international labor standards to decide cases before them. And uh, it's... Uh, uh, excuse me, let me put this uh, off. I'm sorry. Yeah. And the, it's, it's amazing that, you know, sort of uh, in South Africa, they don't have to be prodded at all. They do that as a matter of course, right? From the labor course, the uh, the common law course, I beat the ordinary benches, but they have bypassed them. The system here is that uh, they have got a parallel labor uh, labor court system. So you have what they call the labor courts, which has uh, 
is the the labor court is the equivalent of the high court bench with all the powers and the except and this is interesting except that in the appointment of judges and this is the ILO loved this the in terms of the appointment of the judges unlike the ordinary judiciary where uh, only the the judicial commission okay the judicial commission is has got some representations from other elements other sectors but the, it's essentially lawyers body the appointment for uh, labor court judges has a significant uh, sort of presence of the social partners so both employers and workers and civil society are part of the appointing committee and quite a few uh you know aspirants for for the labor court bench have not made made it because uh, there has been an objection from the, the from the social partners so it's that kind of influence that really uh is very interesting and of course beyond south africa and this is talking of where there have been stars hopeful stars and fading away the Sudan is one where they, at the height of, in the 80s, at the height of the military regimes there, they intervened and somehow uh, kind of sort of made it better in terms of the treatment of the, by the military government regime of, uh, of workers, uh, trade unions in particular, and of course the old Bema, uh, you know, my 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 ma my I can never pronounce this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is me me Myanmar Myanmar. Yeah. Uh, now it's gone back, and this is interesting in terms of the way the flame of democracy there has been extin extinguished. You probably know much more than I I do. My my knowledge here is dated, but what I do know is that from the CFA point of view, we do have problems with Myanmar now. And, uh, and that, remember, was the, the swan song in terms of, uh, you know, the success, not only of the ILO, but much more particularly the international community, the, the UN, in terms of bringing democratic change to that country. And now, and of course, the, the president, the current president was uh, a Nobel Prize laureate, and uh, it's now gone back to you know to those that that days, not as dark as those days, but basically like that. And that's the same with with the Sudan now. I mean, uh, Sudan since the the initial ILO intervention late eighties has never really sort of uh, uh, reached the the sky in terms of democratic kind of governance. They, they have now, I think there's a, an apparent kind of shift towards the uh, progress there, but it's by no means assured uh, because it's a, it's a transition government that he followed the, the ousting of the military government. Uh, whether that to sort of continue to be progressive is another, is another uh, question. So you have this kind of, uh, and uh, here I want to dwell on the uh, the successes, the apparent successes of ILO intervention, but also the limits of those interventions. And one might ask, what accounts for those? And I think, uh, uh, I suspect, uh, uh, you Brazilians who probably have a much better idea of what, and in fact, uh, that is Professor Antonio's link that, you know, you look at the country's history and what whatever is happening there, that accounts for uh, the ty type of labor law, the, the type of industrial relations and so forth. So there's good, I think we've got to, uh, to reflect on this. Why is it that in certain circumstances, the ILO has gone in, and made a difference. Lots of uh, factors could be just on the verge, like in South Africa, of a breakdown of a system. It could be the international 
multilateral system. It could be, uh, and you know, matters linked to, uh, you know, sort of uh, needs, uh, poverty, inequalities, you know, back and forth. So this is, uh, and uh, in Africa, in fact, it's even much more interesting beyond South Africa in terms of if you look at the, the relationship between uh, the flame of democracy that will sort of will be, will be lit and then go out and back and forth. So you go back and forth like that, yeah. So I don't know, it's, please feel free to, uh, to share your, your experience in terms of Brazil and the, uh, Lat the rest of Latin America. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Anna? Hi. About Brazil? Yes. So, such an interesting subject, huh? And yes. I can uh, share a little bit this uh, research I did yes. when I did LLM in the University of Toronto. Yes. And what I study was the effects of the uh, ILO action on freedom of association in Brazil. Yeah. And in the case of Brazil, uh, I think one important feature was the corporatist system. Yes. Uh, end up involving the official trade unions yes. in a system that has important limitations to freedom of association. So yes. in a way that trade unions themselves were not in favor of a trade union reform that would support free, more freedom of association. Yeah. And the ILO yeah. uh, would act with these trade unions. So yeah. it's like the ILO was acting with the people who did not want change. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they did not cause changes. So I yes. study at the time some specific policies that the ILO would support in South America and in Brazil. And yeah. that was the main feature. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in this work, I kind of conclude that, you know, the ILO could try to act also with, try to identify and act with organizations that wanted to promote changes. Mm -hmm. That of course would be it, it's a hard situation for the ILO as an external yeah. actor. So the ILO would always try to act, trying to promote the context for change. So it's yeah. an yeah. indirect action, not a direct one, because their own nationals have to be the leaders of their change. Yes, and yes, yes. It's not easy at all. I worked with Professor Freitas and he can talk about this and Professor Siqueira in this forum, remember Freitas? Yes, yeah, yeah, I know. It feels like it was like 200 years ago that it was a very interesting experience based on social dialogue to reform mm -hmm. the trade union system in Brazil. And at yeah. the end, it did not work out and one one factor was that the trade unions themselves did not want the change. Any of the employers, any of the employers, yeah. organizations, all, all employers, yeah. yeah. But uh, as, as you were going back to the to the Poland to the Polish experience, I was remembering that we we face we we lived here in Brazil a very yeah. a, a very important movement labor movement during the the late 1970s and early 1980s, yeah. uh, when we, um, and, and this movement, this labor movement, this union movement uh, was very important to put away the, the, the process towards uh, uh, democracy, towards yes. established democracy in Brazil. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think we lost, uh, uh, at, at some time, I don't know when, but we lost the opportunity to go further and to and, and, and enlarge uh, the the commitment with freedom of association. And I think we started we, we we stopped it in the middle of the way, 
And yeah. uh, the same thing happened uh, with, uh, with the democracy, with the democratic movement. We didn't have, uh, like uh, South Africa, uh, the conciliation committee, uh, the yeah. transition justice. And to a, uh, to a certain extent, I think this is still a, um, bothers our democratic stabilization. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, we we didn't go through all the the democratic agenda to uh, and and uh, to 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 accomplish the what you have done in South Africa with the conciliation committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, uh, well, like uh, we have some political leaders. One of them, yeah. the current uh, 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 sir in the office, <laughs> that says. States that we didn't have a dictatorship, and yeah, uh, yeah. well, it, I think I think some experience. It's important to go uh, and to yeah. leave it uh, as deeply yeah. and, and as farther as we can. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You you are both right. You know, it's interesting because it, uh, it's remarkable how one would assume on the face of it that the trade unionists would be in favor of reform. But that's not, it's not only Brazil, by the way. <laughs> we have picked up this Peru, Colombia, all over, and not only in, in South America, that the, the unionists, particularly the leadership, they don't want to change. They want sort of uh, the status quo to continue. And that was in the, in the 70s, by the way, the sort of the, the big thing as well in the UK, in, the, you know, in Britain. So you would have uh, sort of the, the ILO and sometimes even governments wanting to change and then the unions holding them back. You know, he, uh, yeah, he, 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 the one example I think is, he, is he, I'm going to come to that was the Swatini, where you sort of, you have uh, two partners wanting to change this, but the you know, the other partner says no, the state partner. So it's very common. But what I think this raises, uh, Anna, is this, is, because you, you, you talked of uh, the uh, broadening, uh, bringing other progressive forces into it. But the other side of that coin, remember, it takes us back to the limits of tripartite kind of it. And, and you, you, you know uh, that, you know, one thing that the employers and the governments and the workers are united on in the formal structures of the, of the ILO is that they don't want to open up the system beyond tripartite. For them, this is a, a miracle that must be left alone and live forever. But the reality is very different. And I'm going to come back to that reality next week when we look at the future of freedom of association. Because the reality is that you have now increasingly in a lot of countries, definitely in Africa, the voice, the strong voice is no longer exclusively, at the, at the least, that of trade unions. It's in civil society. And it's interesting to to see at how that I think is going to pan out in the years to come. So it's very interesting. The you know to, uh, it is it, is is wrong to assume that unions are progressive. And I think I told the story my of my own experience when I chaired the uh, the Employment Conditions Commission here, which is a which uh, dealt with vulnerable workers we sort of, we tried to put in minimum standards where there was no collective bargaining. And uh, the unions, uh, when I chaired it, they were my major opponent, stumbling block, not the employers, not the government. And the reason is that for them, they did not want the weak unions, particularly unions that were entirely women, the domestic workers, a lot of the farm workers, because for them, they saw they must bring everything down. It's interesting. And these were supposed to be, you know, progressive forces that would want to improve the, the conditions of other workers. They did not want to do that. So it's interesting, the assumption that the unions are always same progressive is not true. Yeah. Well, same here in Brazil, considering domestic workers, huh? 
Yes. Uh, the end of the 80s, the main allies of domestic workers' trade unions who are ver that are very traditional and have struggled a lot to survive were yeah. the uh, women's movement and yes. black movement, not the traditional yeah. trade union. No, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can believe that. I mean, uh, yeah, I can, it's exactly the same, the same word here. And uh, in fact, I struggled one of, I, ne I never achieved much. I mean, I shared that word for almost uh, 12 years and there's only one achievement I can sort of point to. And that was to have them included in the unemployment insurance fund. And that was a struggle. The unions didn't want it, you know? So, yeah. and in South Africa, I don't know how many in terms of numbers you have, but here they are, uh, at least a, a million strong. And these are the people, if you look at it, they are abused, they bring up children, you know? And, and interestingly, they enable other women to work because a lot of the sort of the employers of domestic workers are women, in fact, in South Africa at any rate. And the, the, one of the most difficult things we had to chat was we couldn't have, we were dealing with employers who themselves were at the lowest level. We sort of, we couldn't have, uh, they couldn't afford the living wage for these people. But what we wanted particularly was to make sure that they were treated decently in terms of working hours, in terms of the basic rights, and then eventually, as I said, in terms of being passed and parcel of the system in unemployment insurance. So it's very interesting, yeah. Now, next word, Victor, please. So Zimbabwe is another uh, example in terms of the link between freedom of association and civil liberties, but a less successful example than South Africa. Uh, Zimbabwe has had for, uh, you know, it started very well, uh, 1990, it got independence, it's very fanfare. The ILO had been at the center of it. It's, the ILO now is not one of its best friends. And then things, you know, started to deteriorate. And another complaint was taken to the CFA. There, have been, there had been a series of complaints. And eventually what stuck uh, you know, at, at the beginning of this century, where a commission of inquiry was uh, was appointed, and for my sins, I was a member of that commission, and it was an interesting. We spent we we spent quite a bit of time in and out there, trying to uh, to get social dialogue started because that that was the only thing we could ever hope for. They were so polarized. And at the end, what we did is interesting. The, the politics of commissions of inquiry, we, we ended up with a report that we thought would give them breathing space. It was a very mild, of course, we didn't gloss over the, the breaches and all that. It was a very mild, we are offered, we recommended that the, they be offered technical assistance, for instance, to train their police, they, you know, the, their military and the, in, in, in how to deal with workers and all that. And for a while, it seems as if they were, you know, they were accepting this. I, I think they were, you know, buying time. But over the last decade, matters, particularly following the, the land kind of problem, matters have got worse and worse. This sort of is gone back. And that's one, one example, I think, uh, you know, sort of whose only success, if at all, would be that, you know, we, uh, the ILO gave the parties, uh, you know, a chance to step back. Because if that confrontation had continued, I think it would have been worse. But it hasn't been successful. Because the, 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 the kind of things that, are in, in fact, we have got another 
another complaint pending uh, before the CFA. And the, uh, it's interesting, just uh, an uh, anecdote, yeah, that uh, yeah, in many cases, many complaints from all over the place, there is a lot of heated debate about going back and forth, you know, between employers and workers. And on Zimbabwe, and this is what I told the ambassador, on Zimbabwe, we don't take more than 10 minutes <laughs> to agree. And that's how bad it is. It's a, you know, an indication of how bad the situation is, that there is not much room even for disagreement. The evidence is so overwhelming. It's like you are you are dealing the way we are dealing with Cuba or China. That in fact, with Cuba and China, we're going to be more careful in terms of the politics of what message you are sending, but not in terms of Zimbabwe. And that's the tra tragedy and the colossal failure. I mean, it's still, I suppose, work in progress, but this is an example where uh, ILO intervention has not been as successful. So for a while, as I said, the parties were given space to resume dialogue, but that as the, uh, the situation, the broader political situation got worse, it, it didn't move. And that again, if you will, is an example of how closely interlinked freedom of association and the wider, broader political dispensation is. And Zimbabwe shows that, that you know, that's the, as long as if things are not going as well in either, it's sort of the, they are interlinked. Sometimes they, they help, uh, they help other words to, uh, you know, to be part of it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in fact, I, I don't know, please guide me, Professor Antonio. I don't know whether we should take a break or just continue because this is a much, it's a much, uh, what would oh, you like? No, it's entirely up to you. You decide whatever you want to break. If you want to break now? Or... Can, can, we, can we take a 10 minutes breather, please? For sure. It's, it's 20, 2018 now from my word. Shall we come back in 20, 10 minutes, please? Okay, 15.30. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Hello. Hello. Hello, are you back? Can we resume, please? Let's go. Hi, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, yes, welcome back. Welcome there. I need that here. Yeah, let's uh, no, let's continue. We don't have much to go by, and you know, yeah, we've we will be concluding quite soon. It's just that I needed a break as well. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Now, another interesting case in terms of I uh, uh, remember before we broke up, I was talking about the uh, the two limits of uh, tripartism and also the limits of viral intervention in terms of uh, encouraging or prom promoting freedom of association. Another interesting case is that we, of Cuba, a founding member like Brazil of the of the ILO, and uh, in the heady 1952, I think that was when the whole thing was started. Remember, the CFA was established in 51, and uh, 52, I think, was a golden start. Surprise, surprise, Cuba ratified Convention 87 in 1952. And, uh, but their registration obviously imposed as as the other socialist uh, members of the socialist bloc, and incidentally, a lot of the uh, African countries and also countries elsewhere. And it's interesting that during this time at the start, the approach of the ILO was much, much le less uh, kind of. Uh, 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 the, the approach was not as, as strict in terms of scrutiny. So they saw, for instance, in in a lot of uh, African countries that they looked the other way and actually allowed these monopolies of uh, trade union confederations. And in fact, in Zimbabwe was one of those. That, you know, sort of the, by government legislation, you only had one until later, of course, when when things became much more complex. I don't know what the, uh, I would imagine that that has never been the case in, in Brazil, has it? Of uh, having legislation at any time that required that all the unions should affiliate to that particular center. And the, what the ILO seems to, their lethargic kind of rationale, they, they skated it a bit was to say, look, Maybe at the beginning, you need this kind of state patronage to encourage to strengthen the labor movement. So for years, a lot of these countries had the, this kind of legislation that required uh, you know, every union to affiliate to uh, a, 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 a center that was more or less created by government. And that the, the argument was that, you know, it would do, encourage them to be viable financially and all sorts of uh, reasons were used. But later on, of course, it became untenable. So that was the case with Cuba. And uh, their legislation imposed a choice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, was in violation of choice for workers to, to freely kind of, uh, you know, choose their own unions. And uh, of course, the Cuban, the organization of Cuban workers took complaint, not to the CFA, but the committee of experts who were seized with the matter because it was under the, the reporting, I think it's Article 19 or Article 22, in terms of and that, they, they fell foul to that. So uh, it's interesting. And later on, if you can go to the next word, Victor, please.
Later on, the Cuban government uh, more or less came back and said they were reviewing uh, the legislation and said, in any case, in spite of the fact that we have got uh, this monopoly legislation, the workers, they are sure they are, the workers were free to choose their, you know, to, uh, to choose their own organization and all that. But experience since then uh, proved that that was not so because they, they started getting, uh, you know, putting, sending to prison some of the vocal ones. I think there were some kind of petty unions who were allowed to function, but they were not effective in terms of uh, the, as long as the, the monopoly trade union center line was the overlying what they did that. But the moment they had sort of uh, true, true searchers for, you know, for freedom of association, uh, you know, the, they, were, they were jailed. And so that conversation still continues. In fact, uh, every conference, every session, uh, I meet with the Cuban ambassador, the minister when he was at the world and they take, you know, there have been very interesting stories in terms of, I think I told you one, uh, a size. And uh, as with China, my approach has been to, and we are going to come to this, he remembers one of the issues I raised as uh, dis discussion points is that we have got to re recognize the reality. That, in a sense, I've got a very mixed, I'm very mixed about that, you know, the so-called reality that you have, uh, you know, a set of rules for some countries, but not for others. And they still and they can they still claim to be part of that organization. That to me seems awkward. But in matters of of freedom of association, at the seven and ninety eight, the intervention of the ILO, or the intervention of the CFA, is much more limited because we are getting to them, not on the basis of having ratified, except in Cuba in terms of eighty seven, but on the basis of these being fundamental principles of the ILO constitution. And they have now started quarreling with that. So if you take China, for instance, there is a very similar uh, legislation that prevents outside, uh, you know, organizations outside the control of the Communist Party uh, to, you know, to organize. And the, of course, the All China Federation of Trade Unions is ideologically linked to the Communist Party. And the, since, uh, I understand 1989, there have been work, uh, complaints. Every year there are complaints of uh, 89 was the worst one because that was the, uh, the, the, the year of the, the square in terms of the confrontation. So you had those, uh, uh, you know, problems, uh, student leaders and other organizations uh, sent to jail and the uh, and this is interesting because the, there was a very, a very bold kind of uh, organization in, in F. Moekas, Sengen, which is a city I know quite you quite well. I visited it, you know, several times, where the sort of uh, the workers uh, stood up and maintained this, and they were crushed in the typical the kind of Chinese way, and that was yeah. the end of it. Yeah. Just yes. a, a question. Uh, I, well, does China still wants to 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 belong to ILO? I mean, uh, what is the the political purpose of joining uh, ILO, despite of the differences between the you know, internal system of union and the freedom of, of association principles of ILO? I mean, yeah. what what are they? Uh, what are, what, what are the, the, the political purpose of keep yeah. inside Melo? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, Professor Antonio, that's the question. But they will tell you and they will argue very strongly that they do follow, you know, your freedom of association. They believe in that and then they <laughs> actually sort of practice it. But, you know, the, that the West does not understand that the freedom of association is simply there to 
to enable the workers as a unit, as a collective, but it, it seems to dwell on these individual liberties. So that's the, the big political question. And they have now, see, once you, you pass, uh, usually it's typical whenever I'm having a conversation with them, they will start affirming the, that principle, that in fact they, they respect this. And it's something that they, they are sort of, uh, they are very happy to respect because it's uh, underlined China is, has got no equals in terms of ensuring workers' rights and, you know, sort of uh, social justice. So they, they tell you that. And then when you press it on, as in the case of the 32 workers that are imprisoned and disappeared, and then they bring, uh, they bring forth the argument that you have got these, uh, the whole, your whole system is Western inspired. It's, you know, it's, it's targeted at us. And you don't understand, we are not going to accept that. It's not uh, acceptable because the organization does not interpret freedom of association and social justice the way it should be. That you, you are dealing with the uh, individual rights, which is, that is uh, for them, anathema. That, that is for them is an exception to real workers' rights. So these are the arguments going back and forth. And yeah, you are right. What's the point of sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, be belonging to an organization when you disagree with these fundamental principles? And my interpretation would be that, you know, it suits them uh, to be part of it because I think better in than outside. And now, and now the, the interesting thing now is, uh, and that is, this is another personal side. The, in 20, last, last year, June, I, the, we made the recommendation to the governing body, taking them off a final kind of report because the office had failed to get them to respond. They were sent numerous times and all that. So in the end, we simply said, look, uh, in the absence of any uh, response from the People's Republic of China, you know, we condemn this. That, you know, those 32 workers must be found. And not only those 32 workers, but other known workers, that those that have disappeared, not trace, but other known imprisoned workers must be released for, you know, workers' activities. And then as I was walking out of the conference after my report, luckily I had both the head of the International Labor Standards Department and the Freedom of Association branch. The, the Director General, and he had the, come directly from Beijing for that conference, confronted me and says, you know, you, you have got no right to be doing this, this report. I said, look, you, you are biased. And I said, look, all, the, all we do in the Committee on Freedom of Association is that once we receive reports, complaints, we don't take them at face value. We go to the governments and say, what do you have to say about this? And then once we have had those responses, we discuss them you know, exhaustively and come to, uh, to an understanding, which as I mentioned to you, is by way of consensus before we sign off on a report. And we, the office tells me, I told them, and I, I looked at the two heads, uh, you know, they told me that they have been in touch with you not once, not twice, three times called your embassy or mission here, and you have simply ignored. So what, what, on what basis do you expect us to, to, you know, to decide other than what the facts or the allegations we have on the table? And then he went into, poof. He was very angry. He was very angry. Eventually, uh, and I sort of, eventually, I sort of was, uh, I, I initially, I, I, eventually, I, I, you know, I, I spoke something in Chinese. My Chinese doesn't exist, but just, just to show him that, you know, I know about China. And I said to him, 
you know, the director general. I mean, I am a frequent visitor to, you know, to, to your country. And one of the things I admire about your country is that they probably have the most efficient, you know, administrative system. So if you really, because this argument was, how do you expect me to find 32 people out of what is 3 billion people? There's like searching for, uh, you know, a needle in a high sack. And I said, on the contrary, you are the most uh, efficient administration. I'm sure you'll find it. So the, the ice was broken, so to speak. And then we started, you know, talking about my, uh, you know, my, my visits to China, particularly Shenzhen, which is in Guangzhou and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's it. So my approach, uh, Professor Antonio, is that with countries like Cuba and, and China, until I think the ILO itself decides beyond the community level what to do with them, the best thing is just to, to keep talking to them. Now and again, like in the case of the, the Cubans, they release parties. I told you about that side where, uh, you know, who the chief of the branch and I were invited to dinner to the, you know, ambassador's house, very kind of, you know, and uh, reminded me of my, my days as a young man in Havana, you know, when I was a student radical and sort of gave us these, uh, I don't know how you, Anna, you were wonderful. You gave us lots of wonderful food when we visited, but you've got to taste the Cuban black beans. Yeah, They're I have, I have that before. They are out of this world. And so yeah. I complimented them and all that. And so, and it happened, uh, funny enough, I mean, they, by coincidence, the Cuban ambassador in Geneva happened to be, to have been ambassador to Kenya and he was in Angola, he's one of the veterans. And all that we, we started talking about that. And, you know, so as we, uh, we are talking, eventually he calls, one, I, I had planned all this because one of, because he, his initial response when we talked to him and his delegation was that these are criminals. That's their standard line. And then he comes and says, look, I've just got something from, from Havana. And uh, you, uh, we have released your, your, your criminals as, as a sign of goodwill for the centenary year of the ILO and as we believe as the founding members that, uh, you know, we should exercise this leniency. And that sort of ended the matter for them. But again, you know, we have a, another complaint. So I don't know how that is going to, to go. But the point I'm trying to make is this, is that look, the ILO in terms of uh, uh, its approach, and it's the UN system, really. With the other UN system, uh, you sort of where uh, there's probably much more of a, a two-sided kind of discussion. But on these kind of issues, where, which are dealing with freedom of association and basic workers' rights, it's very difficult to know to for them to fit in this and. The question you asked, why do they belong to that? And my guess, as I keep saying, is that I think for now, it sort of it suits them. But the other thing that he said, the, the Chinese director general said to me when we talked, was that, uh, and they had just sort of got out of a, a budget meeting. And he said, the People's Republic of China has supported the, the the director general's increase in the budget. And increasingly, we are supporting a lot of, you know, technical programs, which is true. They are trying to feel uh, America is retreating. The Scandinavians are always there. And, you know, so the Chinese are uh, sort of moving in and supporting a lot of ILO programs. The ILO, uh, as you know, has got no money of its own. It depends on this. A lot of it depends on, on the technical programs. Even the technical assistance is not ILO money. It's the partners, uh, social partners that 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 it you know. And China has filled in those, and with it now, and this is these are the 
the politics of international organization, they are pushing uh, for better positions in the organization for Chinese nationals. It's that, it's that kind of, so that's another story in terms of the, the mixture of, of the interplay, you know, between this, the, uh, the struggle for, for international labor standards, if you like, particularly freedom of association and democracy, and the other dynamics of the politics in the organization. Next word, please. Uh, so that's China. Uh, next slide, please, Victor. And then of course, I, I mentioned Belarus, which is now up in arms. And funny enough with Be Belarus, I mean, there was a commission of inquiry appointed there and seems as if they were hedgy, making headway. Now, as you probably know, there is a, politically it has erupted. There. There's still protests all over, but, uh, you know, sort of interestingly, it seems as if uh, trade union rights have not been entirely abrogated. So that commission of inquiries probably still has got some, some influence, but it's, you know, it's a work in progress. But the other case, of course, is a, uh, is the, the country uh, in Latin America, and that's the, the Bolivian uh, Republic of Venezuela. And uh, there, as you, it, it's really, there has been a commission of inquiry there, which has reported, but uh, as far as I know, the, the breach of workers' rights there is rampant. And of course, again, going back to this, a uh, link between democracy and freedom of association, where the the sort of the political uh, sphere is, they have you know has got an impasse. Political impasse continues. It's very difficult to conceive of a situation where freedom of association would be respected, unless of course by design or inadvertently there is space for the unions and the workers and employers organizations, but it doesn't seem to be that in, in Venezuela. Maybe I'm being hasty, but that's, uh, uh, that's the sort of uh, the preliminary view. We are looking at the, the complaints after, after the commission of inquiry. They haven't uh, sort of come engaged it fully to justify any, any hope of, of furthering democracy. And these similar cases, if you go up, please, uh, uh, Victor. Similar cases in terms of the uh, Middle East, the cases there are Bahrain, which is not so much as a trouble, but Iran is. Iran is really a hot spot. And uh, Iran, in terms of uh, its opposition to anything that uh, mirrors uh, what it causes as the Western sanctions is anathema to them because they, they are standard response every time I've met with them is that, what can we do? You know, you, the Americans are after us. You, they, they are making life impossible. We can't respect these rights if we do not have the capacity to do it. Your technical assistance has been offered in fact, there, that, there is a program that is still continuing, but uh, I would be very surprised if there was a turn, uh, a turn round any, any time sooner, because they seem, they have got a very deep sense of grievance against the, the West and the, you know, by, as a consequence against uh, uh, matrilateral institutions like the ILO, because they see them as simply feathering the interests of the West. And coming closer home, and this for me, for now at any rate is a success story, was the, the former Swaziland, the Satini now. I, for my scenes, I read the ILO sent me a direct mission there. I had a, a direct mission. And the, the background is interesting. For years, 
I uh, the sort of saved they had sent me as uh, saved as part of the ILO technical uh, teams of experts to draft their law. And every time we drafted, we made recommendations, they they went back on them. They never passed them. And interestingly, they passing the US passed, uh, I think this must have been, well, I think the 90s actually, the African Growth Opportunities Act. And th that opportunity, that, that act enabled countries to export to the US, you know, with exemption to some tariffs. And uh, the case of Eswatini and the Lesotho, they are very interesting because what you have there, uh, growth manufacturing, you know, sort of they make, they make things, but Chinese kind of factories that make, make all sorts of shoes. You know, not not PRC, not the communist word from Taiwan. And now the Americans, of course, and this is interesting again, look, said, look, we are not going to allow any country that does not observe the fundamental kind of workers' rights to export. So they were making that noise for a number of years. And then, of course, I think, of course, it was the, from the American point of view, this was national interest really. So they, they are national interest and that of the ILO. That's, this is my, my reading. I think that has been confirmed by some, some colleagues at the ILO coincided. So eventually, all of a sudden, there had been warnings uh, in Swaziland then, and Swaziland was ignoring. They, they withdrew, they suspended Swaziland. And all Swaziland has got apart from his sugar cane which is exported to South Africa mostly, are these Chinese factories. So it really hit them hard. So when I was sent to head that mission to convince them, in fact, my problem was not with them. It was with the American ambassador because he, she was not sure that they would do follow up, that they, they would take this matter seriously. So I sort of, uh, uh, I and the local, I headed the mission and two other people in the mission, including the, the director of the, the regional office here in, in, in Southern Africa. We had to convince her that, you know, I think they have reached a, a point where they can't afford not to do this. And uh, I, I think we are right in that regard because uh, they literally sort of asked for, uh, for somebody to go and he simply draft the new, the new law that would be in keeping with the ILO international standards. And that was done. And now they sort of, they were so pleased uh, during the, the centenary, uh, the cent centenary celebrations, of course, the king, they are a kingdom. Their king went there and sort of was able to assure the ILO that now, you know, matters are okay, they are keeping with what is, yeah, so that's, a, for now, that is a, a successful story. A similar intervention of the initial success at any rate was made in, 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 in Indonesia as well, yeah. Next, please. So, what can we conclude from this? As I said, uh, freedom of association and democracy for what I've tried to show uh, interlinked. Both conceptually, as I try to show, particularly when you go into matters of civil and uh, civil liberties and basic rights, but also practically, because vice versa, where there is room for freedom of association, the chances are that, you know, democracy will prevail and vice versa. Uh, but the ILO drive basically is that uh, democracy must not only be available in the broader political framework, but in a way it should start with the social and economic spheres and therefore freedom of association is a significant kind of driver for, for, for democracy. That uh, in, in a place 
where the the populace the 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 population at large have a representative uh, voice uh, this is uh, encourages and reinforces uh, you know freedom of association that uh, organize representation which is a, a symbol of democracy actually ensures rule of law because where people are organizing themselves they are following particular uh, precepts particular uh, principles and those principles and organizational rights are founded in law so that it it actually encourages uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, democracy and uh, so what has happened here is that he, in a lot of ways is still i keep emphasizing it's still work in progress there have been some visible successes not not enough in my view but uh, some uh, is work in progress. Some, as we saw, they are problematic and will probably not be, be sort of uh, accomplished as soon as the, you know, the ILO and the proponents of uh, freedom of association would like. But this is the, 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 the kind of the picture that, that, that emerges. And if we can go to uh, the next slide, please. So the struggle for democracy continues. And th th I started with these uh, talking points. I don't know whether uh, people would like to, to refer to them, ask questions and all that. Hi, Professor. Yes, 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 Bruna. Hi, it's Bruna here. Um, yes, Bruna. Okay. Could I um, make two questions? Yes, please. One, yes, please. one uh, is um, that we're seeing this decline of um, union membership and collective bargaining yes. all around the world. Yes. Um, could you share with us um, if what, what ILO is doing, if there is a, a project yeah. specific? Yeah, yeah for that and the second one would be if you also could share with us um, uh, a successful case in another country uh, about uh, any collective bargaining um, that made uh, gender equality more th that improved gender equality yeah yeah Yes, I mean, the first question is a, a very important question, which we are going to come back to next, next week. But for now, all I can say is that, uh, yes, I think the, the ILO now is aware of the limitations in terms of uh, collective bargaining and freedom of association. And there, are, I know there are at least one or two projects where they are trying to encourage that first by working with the uh, governments and social partners in terms of changing legislation and the, you know with the and this a, a diverse set of countries including japan because japan which uh, i keep referring to japan which has it's a very mild and very committed country like canada like canada they have you know sort of uh, ratified both 87 and 98, but they are having trouble, you know, sort of uh, uh, extending collective bargaining and freedom of association to the public uh, sector. And one of the, the reasons they, 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 the major reason they point out is that it's not for lack of government intention, but the public does not want it and the, the other department is very cool sort of following public opinion so that is one of the the projects i know they have they are it's not so much project because japan actually is a, a donor of technical assistance not a not a receiver but in terms of trying to work with the parties there to find a way uh, and the, the japanese now have started on a, a process a process of reform 
whom they which they hope that eventually the public will accept. With other countries, it's much more much more sort of interventionist than that in terms of uh, change of uh, legislation, but also trying to give the social partners assistance in various ways. But whether that would be enough, that's something else, because it's a, it's a question of the changing, and we are going to reflect on the changing work uh, nature of the workplace, particularly in developing countries, where the uh, you know the, the the sort of the formal sector is, is shrinking. And I'll give some some sort of uh, figures there that will be as astounding in terms of whether you uh, you know collective bargaining or the workplace as we know it in the face of uh, changes in the world of work. Uh, would survive. So that's for the first question. The second question, don't get old, you, I, I, I have forgotten, believe it or not. My long-term memory is <laughs> much longer. No problem. <laughs> yeah, the second question you said, yeah. Because well, I had... Um, if there is a successful case uh, that helped to improve uh, gender equality, the yeah, successful yeah. Co uh, collective bargaining case, yeah, yeah. No, not a collective bargaining case, but in general. Yeah, I that is an interesting question because I think I should be able to to find that case. I, but I can share with you uh, the cases of South Africa and Rwanda uh, in terms of uh, gender equity and the search for gender equality. And one is not talking simply particularly in the case of Rwanda. You are not talking about just the figureheads. In South Africa, collective bargaining in terms of gender mainstreaming has succeeded. I can't give you a, a particular uh, case now, but I'll try and get, uh, you know, sort of one or two examples from the Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration, uh, because, uh, their director, who is a, a student of mine, is working on his PhD in that area. So he, he will share that with me. And uh, in Rwanda, it's amazing. I mean, the 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 AU has got this uh, declaration that all countries must aim, at least in terms of public uh, representative uh, bodies like parliament and civil service and all that, they must at least be 30% representation of women, not tokens, you know, real representations. A lot of them, of course, is, is tokens, but Rwanda is very serious about it. Rwanda is, is, is amazing how it has mainstreamed. In fact, they are at something like 40% now in terms of NDC at every level, not simply at the lowest level. And uh, so, but uh, I'll come back, I'll see if I can get hold of it. Uh, an example, uh, you know, of collective bargaining has happened here, where, you know, sort of, and and surprisingly, the the, work, the domestic workers union that was frowned down upon by the unions now is gained strength, but not through unions, through uh, NGOs, you know, civil society in terms of, uh, you know, encouraging and making sure that the the women uh, organize themselves better, yeah. Thank you, Professor. And thank, thank you, you for, for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, for sharing thank you. it's a pleasure. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so, Professor Antonio, this is where I think we, uh, we should stop just to let everybody know that our last lecture i'm hoping will be much more reflective because that's where i want to look at what the the end of the ILO century means and what what lies ahead in terms of uh, looking at the changes in the workplace and the kind of uh, uh, efforts that the organization is trying to renew itself. Some might say 
uh, sort of uh, to reinvent itself because the, as I, I said at the beginning somewhere, the world has changed for the ILO and it still has this mission. And, uh, you know, sort of with a, a global kind of, uh, you know, community that is increasingly uh, economically and socially unstable, inequality increasing, poverty increasing, and as if that were not enough, more and more workers being redundant without the skills that are needed, you know, to, to work in the modern, uh, modern place. And of course, I think we could also reflect on the impact of COVID, what it has mm -hmm. meant. I mean, COVID uh, has been, I mean, both Brazil and South Africa, we know the effects. I mean, that's uh, horrific here in terms of the, the questions, the issues of balance between health and economic world. And uh, ironically, and this is the only inadvertent kind of benefit, if you could call it that way, is that it has uh, brought the future of work much, you know, much ahead. I mean, here, here we are, we are talking now. Yeah. And in fact, now I got a man, Microsoft, what have they done? There was some program that was in permanent, now they have made it permanent. So you will make offices uh, absolute, but that's just part of the story. The, I think the negative story is much, much bigger and much more fatal than that. So we'll look at all these inflections and what they mean going forward. So, Professor, so, any, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, um, 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 uh, any questions, please? Um, welcome. We are, yeah. Okay, uh, Professor, thank you, thank you so much for one more wonderful lecture, and we are very anxious about uh, the next one, the the real final. So, uh, I think it'll be very appropriate to do to, to draft uh, a for freedom of association. Yeah. Future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Obrigado. And Victor, my friend, thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> and thank you, Rick. Professor. Have a nice week. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Take Professor. Yeah, yeah. It was bye a bye. great lecture. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Thanks.